Good morning, everyone. Um, this, um, this is the day that uh, the Lord has made, and so it is great to be with you as we get to worship him and join the saints who have gone before us in praising the Savior's name. So welcome for those who are visiting. We're glad you're here with us, both in person and online. And if I can just make a quick announcement before we start our service, um, we will be having a Good Friday service this year. So April 2nd, 7 p.m. here at the facility. I think all of the other announcements are things you've probably seen before. So let's go ahead and start our service with a time of silent prayer. And I should also say that we're going to go ahead and return to how we were um, worshiping before. So um, don't be surprised when you hear, uh, please stand and so forth. So let's go ahead and pray. Lord, we thank you for preparing the way through your Son and by your Spirit that we could stand before you and proclaim the greatness of your glory, the goodness, and this is what we pray in his name. Amen. Let's stand as we hear the Lord's call to worship through the psalmist, Psalm 86, verses 8 through 10. There is none like you among the gods, O Lord, nor are there any works like yours. All the nations you have made shall come and worship before you, O Lord, and shall glorify your name. For you are great and do wondrous things. You alone are God. greet you this morning. Grace to you and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. You are I trust, O oh my God. Let's go ahead and sing our first hymn, The Heavens Declare Thy Glory, number 113.
Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. So let's respond to God's mercy by singing number 181. We come, O Christ, to you. Well, this morning we begin that chapter in the Westminster Confession on the Lord's Supper. I'd like to make a couple remarks before we read these two paragraphs. You might remember that Luther made his, one of his most famous statements during the time of the Reformation when he said that justification by faith alone is the article upon which the church stands or falls. And John Calvin put it in his own way. He said, the doctrine of justification by faith alone is the hinge upon which everything turns. And what surprises some people is that the Protestant Reformed catechisms and confessions spend more time talking about the Lord's Supper than they do the uh, the heart of the Reformation, namely justification. Westminster Confession of Faith has six paragraphs on the doctrine of justification and eight on the Lord's Supper. Now, that might not sound all that significant to you, but consider this, 361 words for justification, 618 for the Lord's Supper. Likewise, the Heidelberg Catechism has three short questions and answers on justification by faith alone. But when you turn to the Lord's Supper, there are eight questions and answers. The Second Helvetic Confession, six chapters on justification, 14 for the Lord's Supper. Why is this? Well, the Presbyterian and Reformed fathers not only tried to explain 
what the Lord's Supper means, but they also sought to distinguish and contrast that from the view held by Rome. And it is a view that they sometimes interact with, with um, strong words. And while the disagreements are sharp, we need to be careful that we don't lose sight of Christ's command that we speak the truth, but we do so in love. And yet we do find examples in scripture of people differing and sometimes uh, quite sharply. The Apostle Paul writes in Galatians that when he saw Peter Uh, doing what was contrary to the gospel, he said, I opposed him to his face. There is a place for using words that are strong. And Paul doesn't do that to Peter because he doesn't love him. He spoke to him that way because he did care and because he desired to bring him back to the truth. And so even when we also sharply disagree with others, let's make sure that we are doing so for the good of others. We will have our differences, and there will be things that separate us uh, when it comes to this doctrine for sure, but let us not assume that as we say these things, we are somehow better, or that we have somehow arrived, or we have more knowledge and, and a better knowledge than the rest. All that we have is what the Lord gives us. So. That is my pastoral plea to you. As you think about these words, um, let's say them in a way that honors uh, our, not only the uh, words themselves, but the intent ought to be the honor of Christ, the love of his name. So let's go ahead and read chapter 29, paragraphs 1 and 2. Our Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, instituted the sacrament of his body and blood called the Lord's Supper to be observed in his church to the end of the world for the perpetual remembrance of the sacrifice of himself in his death, the sealing of all benefits of it to true believers, their spiritual nourishment and growth in him, their further engagement in and to all duties that they owe to him, and to be a bond and pledge of their communion with him and with each other as members of his mystical body. In this sacrament, Christ is not offered up to his Father, nor any real sacrifice made at all for remission of sins, or the living or dead, but only a commemoration of that one offering up of himself by himself upon the cross once for all and a spiritual offering of all possible praise to God for the same, so that the Roman Catholic sacrifice of the Mass, as they call it, is most abominably injurious to Christ's one and only sacrifice, the alone propitiation for all the sins of his elect. As we turn the page, let's go to the Lord now in prayer, and we will lift up these needs to his throne of grace. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for the great love that you have shown to us in sending your Son into this lost and dying world to seek and to save, to find, to bind up and heal, to restore and to unite in his person all whom you have chosen. And we thank you, Lord, for not passing us by and leaving us in our sin and misery. Thank you for sending your spirit to us, to awaken us to your holiness and also to the way of escape from your wrath. And Lord, we wish this morning that we could live lives that better reflected these realities. We wish that we could come to you today saying that we are most definitely more holy in every aspect of our lives. We confess that the holiness that we have is not without grace 
and it is not apart from Christ through the work of your Spirit. And so we thank you, Holy Spirit, for your work that you do among us, and we ask that you would continue your work in your people and in this world. Father, we pray this morning for the uh, country of French Guiana. We thank you, Lord, for the freedom that they have, despite the fact that they lived for so many years in slavery and uh, under the rule of others. Lord, we would wish that they would live in their freedom under the rule of Christ. And while there are many there who would say that they are believers, uh, the walk of their lives, the patterns of their thoughts and actions and words say otherwise. Lord, we ask that you would bring revival to your church, a renewing of their commitment to love Jesus by loving one another and doing what the king commands. We pray, Lord, that to this end there would be the interpretations and translations of scripture that would reach tribes that are lost. We pray, Lord, that you would grant success for uh, those who work as missionaries there. And we do ask, Father, that that nation would be a nation that in many ways is reflective of your amazing grace. And we also pray for your common grace to curb the sin that so easily ensnares, that come at them and us from so many different directions and angles, from the things we see on TV and the, and the internet to uh, the things we come in contact with on the street. Lord, there is a real sense in which the decay is, is literally everywhere. And so we pray, Father, that you would give wisdom to all those who are in authority over us, that they would make decisions and pass bills and make laws that are good and right for the flourishing of all, that the gospel may continue without um, any interference. We thank you for not only the gospel, for, but also for the work of healing that you do in the lives of your people. And we do pray that Julie would continue to mend and feel better. We think this morning of Sandy Holton as she has um, passed out this past week and hit her head and, and has a concussion. We ask, Lord, that uh, you would please cause the headaches to go away and that there would be uh, no lingering or compounding um, damage to her fall. And we ask that you would encourage Sandy and Dick during this time of her healing. We also ask for your mercy to be with Andrew and Remy's boss and coworker as they go in for surgery. We pray, Lord, that uh, the surgeons would do their job well and that they would uh, fully recover and be able to return to work alongside of them and to give uh, leadership as well. And Father, we ask that uh, in this hour you would give your leadership to us as we open up your word. We pray, O oh Lord, that it would produce the fruits of righteousness and holiness in our lives. Help us not to waste these moments or to wonder at other things, but to fix our eyes upon your word and to see the, the deepness of Jesus, who taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I ask you to take your Bibles, or it is also printed in your bulletin. The scripture reading for today is John chapter 14, verses 7 through 14, and let's stand as we read God's word. John 
John chapter 14, beginning in verse 7. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is enough for us. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long, and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, Show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me, or else believe on account of the works themselves. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do because I am going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me for anything in my name, I will do it. The grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of the Lord endures forever. Please be seated. About 1,500 years or so ago, Gregory the Great, he wrote this. He said, Scripture is like a river, broad and deep, shallow enough here for the lamb to go wading, but deep enough there for the elephant to swim. Did you see the elephant swimming as we read our passage? No? No? Let me help you. Verse 9, Jesus said, If you have seen me, you have seen the Father. What in the world does that mean? Verse 12, Whoever believes will do greater works than Jesus. Verse 13, Ask anything in Jesus' name and he will do it. Three very difficult sayings, and so these will be our three topics for our sermon this morning. Number one, what they have seen, verses 7 through 11. Number two, what they will do, verse 12. Number three, what they will ask, verses 13 through 14 what they have seen, what they will do, and what they will ask. So first, what they have seen in verses 7 through 11. Peter has asked his question about why he cannot follow Jesus. He has given his answer. Thomas has said to Jesus, we don't know where you're going, so how can we possibly know the way? And Jesus gives his answer to Thomas that he is the way, the truth, and the life. And then Jesus says something that is so tantalizing that the disciple Philip cannot help but ask a follow-up question. What is the thing that has hooked them? It's verse 7. Jesus said, If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on you do know him and have seen him. If you had known me. That's the first thing to tackle. This is the greatest problem facing every human being in the world. When John wrote his gospel, he started with this statement early on in chapter 1. He said that Jesus was in the world and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. 
And this isn't just a problem for the world. This has also been a problem for God's people. And we can use as representative of the sampling we could give the prophet Jeremiah, who talks about Israel and their relationship and understanding of the God that they were to be in covenant with and to worship. And the Lord files his complaint against his people. Let me give you the verses. You can look them up on your own, and I'll just read them for us. Jeremiah 2, verse 8, the priests did not say, where is the Lord? Those who handle the law did not know me. Jeremiah 4, verse 22, for my people are foolish, they know me not. Jeremiah 9, verse 3, they bend their tongue like a bow. Falsehood and not truth has grown strong in the land, for they proceed from evil to evil, they do not know me. Or verse 6 of that same chapter. Heaping oppression upon oppression and deceit upon deceit, they refuse to know me, declares the Lord. So, the world does not know him. Israel, in time past, did not know him. And now, here are the disciples who have been with Jesus for three years, and they don't know him either. Jesus asks the question in verse 7, or he, he makes the statement, if you had known me, if you had. He says in verse 9, have I been with you so long, and still you do not know me? Now, to be sure, they believe some things about Jesus. They believe he is special. They believe he is the Messiah. They would say without reservation, he is the Savior of the world and there is no other. But that is where their knowledge stops. Like Israel before them, in covenant with God, with the benefits of the temple and the sacrifices and the prayers of the priests, and the law, and the prophets living among them, here are these 11 who have been with Jesus for three years, who have heard him teach and have seen the works that he has done. And still, Jesus could say, if you had known me. Now, there's another problem with not knowing Jesus. Because Jesus says, not knowing him is compounded in that you not only don't know him, you do not know the Father either. And when Jesus speaks of the Father, that's just shorthand for saying God. If you do not know Jesus, you cannot possibly know God. And this puts the disciples then exactly on the same footing as every other human being who has walked the planet with the same need. If God does not open their eyes, they will remain in ignorance. This is why the Reformed tradition has always said that regeneration must come before faith. You will not have true and proper illumination and understanding if God does not first come and open the eyes and the ears and the hearts of his people. If he does not do so, there will be nothing but spiritual darkness and ignorance. But what we do know about the disciples is they were regenerate. That's the thing. They did believe. John tells us as early as chapter 2, when they went to the feast and Jesus turned the water into wine, he said the disciples put their faith in him. They did believe. So what does he mean, if you had known me? Obviously, he's not talking about the disciples being able to spot him in the crowd or being able to pick out the sound of his voice amongst others. He's not talking about what he looks like or the things that he likes to do. They know all that stuff. So what does he mean, if you, have, if you had known me? And I believe that the statement that helps us understand that one is what follows. You would have known my father also. Jesus is not talking about just what they can see with their eyes. 
he is talking about something deeper. He's going deeper. Jesus is saying there is something about his relationship to the Father that is unlike every single relationship they have and we have. Let me ask you, look around the room here. Can, can people know you without knowing your parents? And the answer is yes, they can. Well, let's hope so anyways, right? Um, counselors will tell you they can learn more about a person by listening to their history and learning about their parents and their upbringing and so forth. But that is an entirely different thing than saying you can't know Frank unless you know Frank's son or vice versa. And that is exactly what Jesus is saying here in his own way. What is he saying? What is the meaning? It's this. He is not talking about his humanity. Jesus is talking about his divinity. He is not talking about his humanness. He is talking about his godness. He is saying, if you would know the one true and living God, you will know him as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, or not at all. He is talking about his divine nature. And here's the wonderful thing, because that spells the end for all of us, were it not for what follows that statement. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. You realize what that is? It's God giving to them what they cannot get for themselves. It is a promise. It is a gift. It is a guarantee from now on, you do know him, which I take to mean that when Jesus dies upon the cross for the sins of his people, when he is raised from the dead on the third day, when he ascends to heaven and takes his seat, then his disciples will know for sure that God walked among them. Philip's not quite there yet. He's confused and understandably so. Verse 8, Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father and it is enough for us. And again, I, I just want to say that uh, like Thomas, who is speaking for the disciples, so also Philip is speaking for the others. He's not saying anything that they aren't thinking themselves. Notice, show us the Father. Now, what does that mean? Jesus has just said, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. And so Philip is doing what Thomas has done. He is getting it wrong. He's disagreeing with Jesus. Lord, if, if you would show us the Father, well, that would be enough. Maybe he, Philip is thinking, you know, do something to help us see the Father like what Moses did for Israel when God came upon the mountain and the smoke and the cloud and the fire and so forth. Or maybe he's asking for a, a sight of the Father like Elijah gets in 1 Kings 19. And God said, go out and stand on the mount before the Lord and behold, the Lord passed by and a great and strong wind tore the mountains and broke in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, the sound of a low whisper. Lord, show us the Father. You choose. There are lots of ways in which you could do that. And if you will just show us the Father, then we can actually agree and say we have seen him. It'll be enough for us. It'll be good. And what they do not understand is what they have is infinitely better. <laughs> they don't have a God who is concealed behind smoke and cloud and thunder and earthquake. They have the God who is revealing himself through the flesh and bone of Jesus. What Paul says in Colossians 1.15, that Jesus is the image of, of the invisible God. What Hebrews 1 verse 3 says, he is the radiance of God's glory, the exact imprint of his nature, the exact imprint. 
This is who is sitting with them at the dinner table, and they don't get it. And let's be honest, we wouldn't get it either. Let's, let's not be too hard on them. I cannot tell you how many commentators use the word dull when it comes to Philip, and I think, well, then I'm right there with him. I need to be sharpened. This is not easy stuff, and you know how confusing this would be. If Jesus said to you, you have seen me, and therefore you have seen the Father, but just in case you misunderstood, I am not the Father, we would say, come again? Right, that's deep. Uh, or the elephant is drowning out there in the river. The doctrine of the Trinity is a mystery. Jesus does not expect them or you to understand it perfectly. How there could be one God who exists in three persons, no one knows. But he does want his disciples to believe what he has revealed. So he presses Philip on his thinking to strengthen his faith. Verse 9, Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long, and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me, or else believe on account of the works themselves. Philip, you've been with me for more than three years now. When you heard me teach, whose voice were you listening to? Was it only mine? Didn't you hear the Father speaking through me? Philip, remember when I took a stroll across the Sea of Galilee with my bare feet walking on the surface of the water? What did you think that you were looking at? You cannot get any closer to seeing the Father apart from looking at the Son. And he says to him, at the very least, believe on account of the works themselves that it was the Father doing them in me even as I did them. Now, an important question comes up at this point. It's a, it's a deep question. How is it that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are three distinct persons and yet one God? And the answer that Jesus gives in verse 10 is summarized in one Latin word. It is the word perichoresis. That word means mutual indwelling. Perichoresis. I am in the Father. The Father is in me. That's different. You and I don't dwell in each other. We are external to one another. You and I are separated by time. We've come into this world at different times, and we'll leave at different times. We have different experiences in this world. We have and share a different space. You are over there. I am over here. Our existence is independent of one another. We are not mutually dependent upon each other. In this sense, you don't need me to exist and I don't need you in order to have life. With God, it is different. The three persons are distinct. The Father is not the Son. The Son is not the Spirit. The Spirit is not the Father. And yet, these three persons are not separable. Jesus said, I am in the Father and the Father is in me. You cannot pull these three apart because they're within each other. Because they are within one another, they cannot be separated from one another. And this, friends, is a mystery more to be believed than understood. And that, I believe, is the direction Jesus' words take us. In fact, this is what he wants us to do. Notice verse 7, just skipping back for a moment. What's the issue there? The issue is knowing. And so you can ask the question, well, how do you know God, right? 
If you had known me, you would have known the Father. And the disciples are struggling. They want to see God with their eyes. And now Jesus shows us how to see the Father as we look at him. Notice how Jesus moves the discussion from seeing to believing. Verse 9, you want me to show you the Father. Okay, verse 10, do you not believe? Verse 11, believe me. Verse 12, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes. That's what he's getting at. What do you believe? Who is the Father? The Father is the Lord God Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth. We have this on good authority from God's own lips, from his word itself, that he is the maker of all things. Well, then who is the Son? And here the creed helpfully summarizes for us. He is God of God, light of light, very God of very God. How are these things to be? We do not know. And to press beyond the boundary that separates human understanding from divine is to venture into foolish speculation, and we should not do it. Because Jesus doesn't ask us or tell us to do it. What does he tell us to do? Believe. The question is, do you believe this? So let me make a comment and then a couple of applications. Well, the first one is, well, if, if God is truly Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, how were people then saved in the Old Testament seeing that they did not know this? And the answer is, they had the promises of God. They had in that shadowy form what would soon be revealed as Jesus, the Son of God, the, the radiance of God's glory. They could only see from a distance and look darkly into the future as God gave it, but what were they believing? They were believing the promises of God. What are we believing? Same promise, but we're standing on the other side of that promise in fulfillment. But it's the same thing. And here is the point. When God reveals himself in this way, you are obligated to believe. If you do not believe, you are simply not a Christian. Now that God has revealed himself in this way, to reject it is to reject him entirely, and there are terrible, horrible consequences. You cannot say, oh, I'm good with God, but Jesus, no, I, I, I'm not really into Jesus. You cannot be good with God unless you are on good terms with his Son. The only way someone knows the Father is to know Jesus. You cannot have a relationship with the Father that is independent of a relationship with Jesus. Why? Because the three are one. And now secondly, for Christians, there's comfort here. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are never at odds with one another. Do you realize that? The Holy Spirit is not the tiebreaker when Jesus and his Father can't agree. They are always in agreement with one another, and this is especially true when it comes to you. For parents with children, we will often find ourselves in different places where we think differently on what the correct course is. With the Holy Trinity, it is never that way. With the three persons of the Godhead, they are never divided in essence or in opinion about you. You will never have the love of Jesus and have the Father's begrudging affection. You will never have the warm welcome of Jesus to be received by him only to be rejected by the Holy Spirit as an enemy. Believing in Jesus, you have forgiveness in him and no condemnation from the Father. This doctrine of perichoresis, this mutual indwelling, says to you, loved by one, loved by all. And I would submit to you, we will get to this later before Jesus is done with his high priestly prayer in chapter 17, that this doctrine has a significant impact upon the Christian life. We'll get to that later. 
To see Jesus, though, is to believe in him, is to see and believe the Father, Jesus says. You cannot have the one without the other. You cannot remove them. You cannot separate them. So secondly, it's not just what they see, but then Jesus turns to deeper waters still. What will they do? Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do. And greater works than these will he do because I am going to the Father. Now, undoubtedly, this would have been a great encouragement for these discouraged disciples. Jesus is going away. They are grieving over it. And they hear Jesus say, uh, my power is not leaving you. The works that I do, you will do. And he says even greater works that had to be exhilarating. And when you get to the book of Acts, we do see those works being performed in miraculous ways. Healing of the sick. Paul getting bit by a poisonous viper and not dying. Peter being led out of prison by an angel when he was awaiting execution. Paul raising a man from the dead who fell asleep on him while he was preaching and fell out the window. There are these works still continuing in the book of Acts, but were those the greater works that Jesus is talking about? I'm not sure that they were. Greater than Jesus feeding 5,000 men plus women and children with five loaves and two fish. Greater than feeding the 4,000 at another time. Greater than walking upon the water. Greater than withering a fig tree with a curse and restoring a withered arm in the synagogue. Greater than those things. Furthermore, as B.B. Warfield observed, when one crosses over from the first century A.D. to the second century, it is like you are stepping into a different world. The environment has changed. The miraculous signs of the apostles are gone and the supernatural healings are left in history in the first century. And so for these reasons and more, I think we can conclude that Jesus is going deeper. He is talking about a greater work not seen with the human eye the way the miracles were seen. Notice what he actually said. It's not, I say to you, you will do all those works and greater works, as true as that turned out to be. That's not what he said. Whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do because I'm going to the Father. You see what he's done? He expands well beyond the 11. He includes everyone who believes in this subject of doing his work. And then secondly, what makes these works so effective? It's because he goes to the Father to receive the Spirit, and he pours the Spirit out upon the church at Pentecost. So what are the works? My answer would be the works that Jesus is speaking of here, in addition to the works that the apostles will do in the book of Acts, are those works of word and deed that bring people to eternal life through the power of the Spirit. Those are the works that Jesus is speaking of. Look at verses 11 and 12, and it points in this direction. Verse 11, believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or else believe on account of the works themselves. Verse 12, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these he will do. Back to verse 11, what is the purpose of the works? So that you would believe. To lead them to belief in Jesus. And in verse 12, what will those people do who believe in Jesus? They will do the works of God. They will do those works that bring other people to believe. The greater works is not more miracles piled upon one another for a few years. The greater works are 2,000 years of people crossing over from death to eternal life by the power of the gospel. It is not only a deeper reality, it is a wider reality. As Jesus is doing his works in the promised land, he can only be in one place in one time as the Son of Man. But when he ascends to the Father and he receives the Spirit, and the Spirit is poured out upon the entire church, and the church goes across the globe, 
then these works are done massively. It's a greater work. Now, lest you think this is crazy, it does happen from time to time, turn back to John chapter 6, where we can see that this interpretation is not a crazy one. It's quite sane. John chapter 6. Look at verse 28. The crowd in dialogue with Jesus, it says, Then they said to him, What must we do to be doing the works of God? Sound familiar? The works, same word. Jesus answered them, This is the work of God that you believe in him whom he has sent. What's the aim? What's the purpose of the work? What, what is the work seeking to achieve? Faith. Belief. What God calls his people to do with that faith is to proclaim it, to show it, to tell others about him, showing the love of God by word and deed, by those good works that he has prepared beforehand, that we should walk in them, that they might see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. In so doing, it's, it's these things that are the significant works, more so than a prayer and sight or what have you. I'm not saying those things aren't spectacular and wonderful and confirming, but they were confirming who Jesus is. Jesus sends out now the entire church saying, you have a work to do as well. Not this supernatural one, but make no mistake about it, there's a supernatural work being done as your tongue moves and your hands are busy. One other place. Look at John chapter 5 since we're so close. Verse 20. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all that he himself is doing and greater works. You could circle that word and put John 14 next to it. And greater works than these will he show him so that you may marvel. For as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, so also the Son gives life to whom he will. What are the greater works that God is doing, continually doing? It is the work of salvation. It is the work of giving life. This is confirmed by verse 24. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. This is the greater work that Jesus is talking about. How will they hear his word and believe and have eternal life? Through those who believed before them. Those who represent him on earth will be those through whom God's life-giving power travels to make more children of God. Going back to John 14 then, the works are, on the one hand, the immediate attestation of the gospel through the disciples, but then the greater works that follow is the preaching of the gospel and the deeds of love and mercy and the salvation of sinners. Where sinners are spiritually dead for more than four days, but for their entire lives, and are suddenly snatched from the clutches of Satan as the gospel awakens them to their danger and welcomes them into the family of God through the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus continues by his Holy Spirit doing this greater work of awakening the spiritually dead so that they would hear his voice, see their Savior, put their faith in him, and pass from death to life on the spot. That is a great work. That is a work you and I could never do. We could heal an arm much sooner than we could make that a reality. And Jesus says, I promise this is what I'm going to do. I am going to pour out my spirit, and you will see greater works. Third point, and we'll wrap up. What will they ask? Jesus says in verses 13 and 14, Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. 
if you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. Is Jesus offering us a blank check? Just put in the amount, I'll sign my name, you can cash it. There are some people who would say, if, if you have enough faith, that's exactly what Jesus is promising here. Still others would come and say, well, you know, Jesus did say if we ask, he'll give it to us. And I asked and he didn't, so I'm done believing. I'm moving on. Again, carefully consider what Jesus is saying. This isn't Jesus saying, just say it this way and it's yours, like the genie in the lamp. You just have to rub it the right way and speak the right words. That's not what he's saying. He isn't saying, look, I'm just here to make sure you get what you want. That's not his prayer for us. Prayer is not trying to convince Jesus to bend his will to us. Prayer is our bending of our wills to him. That means at the very least when Jesus says, ask in my name, he is saying, ask according to my will. Asking in Jesus' name is not to get what Jesus doesn't want for you. When you are asking in Jesus' name, you are asking, give me your will and your wishes. Let it be done. This is virtually the same thing as what he says when he teaches the disciples to pray. When your kingdom come, your will be done. And it will be done when we are praying that way. The Puritan pastor, Christopher Ness, put it really well when he said, Where God hath not a mouth to speak, men must not have a tongue to ask. So this, at the very least, means that it's not just a tag on, say it in Jesus' name and you can have whatever you want. This is a say it in my name, seeking my will. And Jesus knows that this is all very good, but also very difficult. He doesn't leave us to struggle with prayers being answered, and they will be answered, all of them, but they will be answered either according to our will, which is bent towards his will, or in an entirely different way. Don't let the disappointment surprise you. So at the, at the very least, we need to be praying, what, what, what is the nature of the kingdom? What is it that God delights in? The salvation of sinners? Growing of faith? The endurance? Love? Deepening of commitments? Knowledge? All of those things, those are good things. You pray for them, Jesus says, you will receive them. According to Christ's will, it will be done. But if we're praying for things that are contrary to his will, and so many have, have rushed ahead, Lord, I, I, I really want to marry this person. This person is not a Christian. Make them a Christian, and then off they go to marry them. That, that, is, that is not praying as Jesus commanded. And Jesus shows us the way of prayer, doesn't he? In the Garden of Gethsemane, he said, take the cup from me. What cup? The cup of his suffering, the cup of God's wrath, the cup of judgment, the, the, the awful death that he was uh, about to experience. He said, Lord, take that cup away from me. And then you see how he bends his will to his father's. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will. And the answer is always yes when we pray that way. So how have you seen the Lord Jesus? Do you see him as your only hope in life and in death? What sorts of things must you do to be saved? You must believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And when you do believe, you learn that you have, even if you have no one on this earth who loves you, you have three eternal persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And they not only love you, they welcome you to bring your requests and promise you that they will give you the right answer. Let's pray.
Father in heaven, we thank you for these hard verses that also give deep comfort and assurance. And we pray that we would live out of the resources of your grace through your word to be more faithful in the things of your will. We pray, Lord, that there would be many who believe on account of the ministry of your church, not just your people here, but everywhere. Let us be quick, O Lord, to speak when you call us to, to be silent when you forbid us to, and to trust when we pray to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Our hymn of response is, Jesus, what a friend of sinners. Let's stand as we sing number 498.
To all of you who have confessed your sins and affirmed your faith in Christ, the promise of Jesus is sure. Whoever eats my body and drinks my blood has eternal life and will not come into condemnation. For on the night in which our Lord was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take and eat. This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. While remaining bread and wine, these sacred elements nevertheless become so united to the reality they signify that we do not doubt but joyfully believe that we receive in this meal nothing less than the crucified body and shed blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. For all who live in rebellion against God and unbelief, this holy food and drink will bring you only further condemnation. If you do not yet confess Jesus Christ and seek to live under his gracious reign, we admonish you to abstain. But all who repent and believe are invited to the sacred meal, not because you are worthy in yourself, but because you are clothed in the perfect righteousness of Christ. Do not allow the weakness of your faith or your failures in the Christian life to keep you from this table, for it is given to us because of our weakness and because of our failures, in order to increase our faith by feeding us with the body and the blood of Jesus. As the word has promised us God's favor, so also our Heavenly Father has added this confirmation of his unchangeable promise. So come, believing sinners, for the table is ready. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Let's pray. Almighty and everlasting God, who by the blood of your only begotten Son has secured for us a new and living way into the Holy of Holies, now cleanse our minds and hearts by your word and spirit that we, your redeemed people, drawing close to you through this holy sacrament, may enjoy fellowship with the Holy Trinity through the body and the blood of Christ our Savior. We know that our ascended Savior does not live in temples made by hands, but is in heaven where he continues to intercede on our behalf. Through this sacrament and by your word and spirit, May these common elements be now set apart from ordinary use, consecrated by you, so that just as truly as we eat and drink these elements by which our life is sustained, so truly we receive into our souls for our spiritual life the true body and the true blood of Christ. We receive these by faith, which is the hand and mouth of our souls. Amen. And so, congregation, let us now go to our heavenly table and receive the gift of God for our souls. Congregation, lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. The bread that we break is the communion with the body of Jesus Christ. Take and eat, remember and believe that his body was broken for you. The cup of blessing for which we give thanks is the communion with the blood of Jesus Christ. So take and drink of it and remember and believe that his blood was poured out for the complete forgiveness of all your sins. Our gracious and heavenly Father, we thank you for this blessing of your holy feast. And although we are unworthy to share this meal with you, it is by your invitation and dressed in Jesus' righteousness that we have come boldly into the Holy of Holies. Instead of wrath, we have received your pardon. In the place of fear, we have been given hope. Our high priest and mediator of the new covenant has reconciled us to you, and even now he intercedes for us at your right hand. Please strengthen us by these gifts 
so that relying only on your promise to save sinners who call on Jesus' name, we may by your spirit honor you with our souls and our bodies. To the honor of Jesus, we pray. Let's stand, congregation, as we sing the doxology, praising our God for these good things that he has done. Receive now the blessing of the Lord your God and go your way in peace. Now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of his Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. <laughs>